Hello and welcome to Economics. Today we begin discussion of probably the most important topic of the entire course and that is supply and demand. What we're attempting to do is to talk about the behavior, characterize the behavior of the two primary participants in a market. We're going to split it into three pieces. We're going to first talk about the behavior of the buyers. Then we're going to talk about the behavior of the sellers and then we're going to talk about how the two of them interact one with the other. One of the most common mistakes that, that uh, economic students make is to try to put the two of them together at least initially. So you begin talking about well what will happen if the price goes down and you suddenly kind of get a muddled a little bit. Well consumers will do this and it'll cause producers to do this and it'll you have to separate those and keep them separate. So you have to think about what will be the behavior of buyers, stop, what will be the behavior of sellers, stop, and then what happens when you put the two of them together. So we're going to split it up into three pieces in hopes that maybe that'll help you think in your thinking about that. So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to characterize the behavior of the buyers. How do buyers react and we're going to try to cut that down to the minimum number of variables. And that's exactly what demand talks about. So let's first talk about, well, what is demand? Demand is the quantity consumers are willing and able to buy at each possible price during a given time period, other things constant. Now that's a, a whole mouthful of stuff and the reason it is is because what we want to look at is to, say, is to be able to characterize what is the behavior of a buyer of a good or service when the only thing they're thinking about is price. Now we all know that there are things other than price that are important in determining whether you buy something or not. But we're trying to whittle it down to nothing but price and say what can we say about their behavior given that there's some change in price. Notice that we have d confined ourselves to a specific time period, so we know that that behavior will change somewhat as time changes because their attitudes will change, what they can afford and what they can't afford, what products are available to them, whether something is fashionable or not, uh, you know, lots of things can change through time. But we're saying in a specific time, holding everything else constant, what will be their behavior? And their behavior is typically called the law of demand, which says that the quantity demanded varies inversely with price, all other things equal or other things constant. In other words, a, a consumer will typically be encouraged by lower prices and discouraged by higher prices. Inversely is a mathematical relationship. It means as one goes up, the other one goes down. Um, it talks about the relationship between two variables. In this case, the two variables are price and quantity demanded. And so uh, the inverse relationship means that as price goes up, the quantity demanded will go down. Now I'll remind you of something we said earlier and that is that we're not concerned about whether this is something that's a consumer want or a consumer need. It doesn't really matter to us as economists. We're only concerned with what their behavior is. Now this behavior occurs for a couple of different reasons. The one is the most, the first one is the most obvious and it's known as the substitution effect. As the price of a good rises, it is a much less valuable good or it's not as good a buy relative to other goods. So you see here a picture of pears and apples. As apples rise in price, they're relative to pears not as good a buy. And so you'll substitute pears for apples. Um, so relatively speaking, they're not as good a way of satisfying your needs and wants. And this is known as the substitution effect. You just substitute pears for apples because the, the uh, pears are less expensive than apples are. And this is the most uh, obvious reason why people are encouraged by lower prices and discouraged by higher prices. There is another reason though, and it's known as the income effect. And the income effect says that as prices rise, 
your real income, what you can buy, actually decreases. Now here we have to make a distinction between our money income and our real income. Money income is simply the dollars and cents that you receive. It's just a number and it's not a very fulfilling um, number. It, the only reason we care about money income is because it purchases for us or buys for us goods and services that we're interested in. So when the price of a good goes down, given that we have the same money income, we can now buy more or we have increased purchasing power. So a lower price actually increases our income and so we'll buy more of a good or service. Now the income effect is typically not terribly strong. Uh, in fact, for most goods and services, it's not a big deal. Uh, our example of apples and pears, uh, we, don't set, we don't suddenly feel a lot uh, richer when the, when the cost of apples goes down. Um, however, there are some goods for which the income effect is fairly substantial. An example of that would be housing. Uh, when the price of houses, if the price of houses were to go down uh, fairly substantially, if the price of houses were to go down by 20%, then we would notice that change in income. On the other hand, if the price of apples goes down by 20%, we don't really notice it. Same thing for automobiles. If automobiles were to go down by 20 or 30%, we'd begin to notice a difference. We'd see a difference in, in our apparent income, and the reason being because that's such a substantial portion of our budget. So for most goods and services, the income effect is not something that you notice. However, it is operative. For most goods and services, the substitution effect is the thing that determines for us uh, why it is that as price goes down, we're much more interested in that good or service. Now, if we look at all possible prices and the quantity that's demanded at each one of those prices, and we were to make an actual list of those out, we would have what's known as the demand schedule, and it would represent for us the law of demand. On the other hand, we might take all of those and actually plot them on a graph and then we would have a demand curve. And the demand curve would be downward sloping um, due to the law of demand. And so here we have one of those. Here we have, on the left hand side, we have uh, four different, five different prices for pizza. Beside those, we have the total quantity demanded by the entire market for the United States. So we see at point A, at a price of $15, our consumers would want to buy 8 million pizzas a week. At a price of $12, they'd want to buy 14 million. Price of $9, they'd want to buy 20 million. Price of $6, 26 million. And a price of $3, they'd want to buy 32 million. So you can see that as the price goes down, the quantity demanded goes up. On the right hand side we have a demand curve and these are just those points plotted over here. So you see the A is 15 and 8, the B is 12 and 14 million, uh, C is 9 and 20 million, and we actually end up with the demand curve which is downward sloping. That is it goes from the top left hand corner to the bottom right hand corner. And that is typical of an inverse relationship. And here the inverse relationship is between price and quantity demanded. Now, demand, um, this is kind of nomenclature or term use, use, usage here. Demand refers to the entire relationship between price and quantity demanded. So we talk about a demand curve or a demand schedule which lists for us not just one but multiple points. It gives us the entire structure of that relationship, not just a single point. Quantity demanded, on the other hand, is a particular point. It is a single point on the demand curve or a single point on the uh, demand schedule. It only gives us one part of the overall relationship whereas demand gives us the entire relationship. So if we make a move from one point to another point, we refer to that as a change in quantity demanded. And that can only happen for one reason, 
and that is a change in the price of the good or the service that we're thinking about. So if we move from point A to point B, then that would be a change in quantity demanded as we move from $15 to $12. Now, what we've been looking at is a market demand, that is, the demand for the market as a whole, but you could do the exact same thing for your own individual demand. That is, you could look at what would this household do at various different price points and what would their demand be at various different price points. Obviously, that would be downward sloping as well, and essentially the market demand exists because we simply sum all the individual demands. Now, things that affect the entire relationship are referred to as non-price determinants of demand. And remember, it's not non-price determinants of quantity demanded because now we're talking about things that move the entire curve, that cause the entire curve to take a new position. The relationship will remain an inverse relationship, but its nature will change. And let's talk about each one of these individually. First, and probably one of the most important ones, is a change in consumer income. And here, we see two different sorts of reactions. Some goods are said to be normal goods, which means that as a consumer's income increases, their demand also increases. And normal here is chosen appropriately because it's the way most goods and services are. As you get an increase in income, for the most part, from most goods, you actually demand more. Um, and uh, remember, we're talking now about the entire relationship, so we're not saying the price has changed, we're just saying that the consumers suddenly have more income than they had before, and so their demand increases. On the other hand, some goods are said to be inferior goods, which does not refer to their quality. It simply means that the demand will decrease as income increases. These are goods that you want to substitute out of. These are goods that you don't want to um, partake of. So uh, if you suddenly have more income, you eat less hamburger, eat more steak, or you eat less ramen noodles and eat more hamburger, um, which is to say that those are inferior goods. They're goods that you substitute out of when your income increases. Again, the majority of goods are said to be normal goods, and some, sometimes they're referred to as superior goods. Uh, I like the terminology normal because it implies that that's the most common occurrence, and in fact, most goods are normal goods, and very few goods are inferior goods. So here, we've had a situation in which the uh, consumers in our market have had an increase in income, so their new demand curve moves from the solid blue line, which is marked D, to the lighter blue line, which is D prime. This is said to be an increase in demand for pizza. That is, they want more at each and every price. So they move, if the price is $12, they move from buying 14 million to buying 20 million. They move from B to F. And this is a, an increase in demand. Notice they did not move up or down along D. The entire demand curve, the entire relationship moved from D to D prime. Similar non-price determinant. Again, we're not talking about the price of this particular good. We're talking about a different price. We're talking about the price of another good, a different good. And here again, for the most part, we have two different choices, two different possibilities. Some goods are said to be substitutes, which means an in increase in the price of one good increases the demand for the other good or causes a rightward shift of the demand curve. So here we might think about um, uh, Subway sandwiches or sub sandwiches in competition with pizza. So if we increase the price of sub sandwiches, then we would get the same sort of uh, shift that we just saw in the last slide for the demand for pizza. If price of sub sandwiches doubled, then we would see an increase in demand for pizzas because the two are substitutes. 
people, our consumers would be substituting out of sub sandwiches and into pizzas and thus it would increase the demand or cause a rightward shift of demand for pizzas. Some things are said to be sub uh, complements and complements means that they're typically used together or in combination. Here, an increase in the price of one of the goods decreases the demand for the other good. And so in this case, we would get a leftward shift. We might think of pizzas and uh, Cokes as being complements. And so if we increase the price of pizzas, then we would see a leftward shift or an inward movement of the demand curve for Cokes because the two go together. Um, the two complement one another. And here complement um, is spelled a little different from the type that you give somebody. Many goods, however, are unrelated, which means the change in price of one good has no impact at all or no effect on the price of the other. So we might think of pizzas and shoes and a uh, change in the price of pizzas doesn't have any impact on the um, demand for shoes or change in the price of shoes has no effect on the demand for pizzas. Changes in consumer expectations is also a non-price determinant of demand. Consumers anticipate income levels for the future, they anticipate price levels for the future, and they actually anticipate availability of goods for the future. So if the consumer comes to believe that in the future their income will increase, then they will increase their demand today. They don't wait until it happens in the future. And both of these coincidentally work both directions. So one of the things that we see during a recession is that consumers get more pessimistic about their future income, and so they decrease their demand. Likewise, on the section of the, of the business cycle, when things are improving, uh, they believe that they're, they get very optimistic about their future income, and so they increase their demand. Price expectations, uh, consumers also predict what's going to happen to prices. If they expect prices to increase in the future, then they will increase their current demand. They want to take advantage of the current prices before they increase. And likewise, the opposite would be true, although they have no real reason to believe prices are going to decrease in the future. But if they believed that prices were going to decrease in the future, uh, then they would decrease their current demand in anticipation of that change in prices. The number or composition of consumers, remember that we're talking about market demand now, so uh, the number of consumers changes the demand level, so as we get more and more consumers, it increases demand, and the actual composition of the population may change it as well. That is, as we get more and more people who are uh, potential consumers of this product, then their demand, that will shift the demand curve in one direction or the other, depending on what that composition um, looks like. And taste and preferences. Uh, consumers change their likes and dislikes. Uh, they change their taste. As that changes, it begins to change the demand curve. So as consumers begin to like sushi rather than pizza, then we see a fall in demand for pizza as they substitute uh, sushi for, for pizza, and it shifts the demand curve. That's the primary reason why we talked about a specific time period uh, rather than letting it run longer than uh, a particular time period. So in summary, what do we learn about demand? Well, we learn that demand is the um, representation of the buyer's behavior, that buyers are encouraged by lower prices and discouraged by higher prices, that it's important for us to make a distinction between demand, which is the entire relationship, and quantity demanded, which is one portion of that relationship, a single point on that relationship, and that there are things other than price that affect uh, that relationship. There are non-price determinants of demand, but when one of those changes, it changes the entire demand curve, not a single point. It changes the whole relationship. And so one of the important things to recognize about demand and law of demand is it is a 
confined to only the changes as a result of the price of the product. Well, that stops us for today in terms of the buyer behavior. Next time we're going to look at the seller's behavior, and then we'll put the two of them together. See you all next time.